it's Michael Ashby, um, who's going to round off um, this day of talks on, uh, with a talk on the phonetic life of John Wells. Mr. Michael Ashby. Well, thank you very much. It's time to turn off the projector. I did think of using it, but I couldn't find anybody to help me make it work. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I, the more I thought about what we could put on the slides at the end of the day, the more it seemed that whatever I would put on could only be banal, and it was time to try and survey things with our imagination and our memories rather than with pictures or even words on the screen. Uh, I did think for a moment there that Professor Lee was going to rob me of my one claim to distinction this afternoon, which is that I will be the only speaker for whom the clock has shown the correct time. <laughs> 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 letting me retain that one little claim to fame. Uh, I'm probably here in my capacity as somebody who can somehow be persuaded to undertake the impossible when asked on a good day, um, or attempt the impossible, because what I've got to do is somehow summarize at the end of a, a day filled with things that I have learned from, uh, summarize the preceding 46 years of achievement and uh, 46 years of history, really, in our subject in this department. Because hard to believe as it is, John came here in 1960, as you've heard, and he's been busy ever since, apart from a few days sick leave, I think he's, he's been <laughs> here the whole time. I must make absolutely plain, of course, that in this early part of what I'm saying, I'm working on the printed sources. I certainly wasn't around in 1960, I was in my pram, as of course you'll understand. <laughs> uh, John, John's explained how different a world it was. It was a very different world, I've given to believe. Uh, <laughs> it was a world where even Cliff Richard, who was more or less John's contemporary, was actually older than he, that was actually younger than he looked. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as opposed to the situation we've had ever since where he's been uh, older, they, I can't, wish I hadn't tried that now. <laughs> in 1960, almost everybody was younger than they looked, given the way they dressed and behaved, I, I believe. John came here from Cambridge, uh, as you've heard, to do a two-year MA. Phonetics and linguistics were all the same in those days. It wasn't separated. Uh, and, of course, uh, <clears throat> he began as a student, as he explained, with Gim and Doc teaching him. We do actually have some of his early work. In my hand, I have one of the first essays he wrote for, for <laughs> Professor Gibson. Uh, and you can have a copy, too. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it was published. Uh, Gimson set the newcomers, the task of describing their own pronunciation. And so John wrote an account of his pronunciation in what was then the prevailing linguistic model of American structuralism, and handed it in. And I, I, I don't quite know what happened, but I expect Gim fell off his chair <laughs> and, and uh, sort of wiped his eyes and read it again. It was such an original and astonishing piece of work Gim was the editor of MF and immediately set about putting the thing into print. And it's here. If you know anything about American structuralism, you'll understand what I mean if I say that in the course of two pages, it comprehensively out Traeger's Traeger. Um, it also shows, I think, some of the things which we see again and again in John's approach to academic work. Um, I'm going to differ a little bit with the assessment of John. In one sense, he's not really a phonetician. If by a phonetician you mean somebody who sits listening all day and filling up notebooks with narrow transcription. And nor is Jack, for that matter. He, he may listen all day, but what he fills up in his notebooks is, is occurrences and pronunciations rather than details. I think the idea of the phonetician as a kind of recording device is a myth invented by Shaw, really. 
John, more, more than uh, just listening, it has always been a kind of phonological systematizer. He's looking for patterns, he's looking for concepts. Phoneticians spend most of their time solving problems, actually, like all other academics, sorting out problems and clarifying things. And if I have to put John's main achievements in one sentence, it is he, he's continually clarified concepts that were so hard to get hold of, and he's attached to them a memorable name, which is then stuck to them. And I only have to mention a few of the things which we owe to John, a rhotic accent. Rotic. There are still a few benighted souls about who will talk about Rful and Rless varieties of English, but rotic is the word. Goose fronting. <laughs> who would not have loved to invent the <laughs> <laughs> concept and word phrase goose fronting? Oh yes, I wish I had thought of that. But the one I envy most of all, the, the, the thing I really wish I had invented. I do, I do envy this, is the happy vowel. <laughs> the happy vowel is my all-time favorite. <laughs> We've had a problem recently with dress raising. <laughs> <laughs> I may be able to help with that. Just so you know. <laughs> John, it wasn't, John wasn't without um, competition when he came to UCL. He's explained that David Crystal was on the scene, but with him from Cambridge came another very talented newcomer, Eleanor Higginbottom. And Gim had to fall off his chair a second time because she wrote another essay of equal merit, which was published in the next number of MF. And it's so interesting that both of the speakers, both, both of the writers, had essentially the same kind of regional origin. The difference was that John was describing RP with faint traces of, well, Yorkshire in his case, but although well, he was born in Lancashire, and Eleanor was describing a Lancashire accent with some influence from RP. And trying to put myself in Gim's place, I think I might have found it hard to decide which essay to give the higher mark to. John's nodding, they were both outstanding, and he had really worthy comments. Uh, we've always had this nice relationship with Cambridge over the years, and although she's not able to be here today, it's sort of pleasing that we have another Eleanor in the department at the moment, also from Cambridge, and she is a homophone of the earlier one, though not a homograph. Oh. I said John didn't spend his time listening or measuring, but there is one notable exception to that, and that is his MA dissertation, which is the one piece of experimental, acoustic experimental work that he has done in his life. He measured the formants of the vowels of RP English. And it must be the most influential piece of work that was never published. It, it is still being referred to. If you pick up the most recent issue of JIPA, there is a paper on goose fronting and related matters. And among the references is John's unpublished MA dissertation as one of the baselines, not only as a source of historical data, but really as the source of the paradigm through which all the measurements are being made, the whole procedure. He finished his MA dissertation just in time for the results to be incorporated in Gim's new book, The Introduction to the Pronunciation of English. And then, as we've heard, the department to its great merit, found a way of keeping him. He presented that uh, in its sort of humorous aspect, reminding us of how informal things used to be in those old avuncular days, but didn't the department do the right thing? Wasn't it the right thing to do? And aren't we so grateful that it did happen that way? So John began teaching and began researching. His teaching must have been extraordinary from the beginning because sitting in one of his classes was Greta Colson, who was writing down what John was saying. I don't know if John had written down what he was saying. He probably made it up just beforehand or on the spur of the moment. But anyway, she wrote it down. And when she'd written it all down, they took it to a publisher. It was called Practical Phonetics. 
and that's the book which has been in print, I think, ever since. I, I was looking at it yesterday, and I couldn't help noticing that the preface starts with sentences which reminded me of something. I thought, hello, this is plagiarised from something. And do you know, it's a dead copy of what's on the Skep homepage. <laughs> or rather, John is still saying on the Skep homepage, some people think of phonetics as a dull subject, but we're going to show you do. And that's what he was saying in the 60s. And he's still doing it and proving it now. Towards the uh, end of the 60s, John put on a spurt to complete his, his PhD which, as we've heard, was about Jamaican pronunciation. The, the PhD is called Jamaican Pronunciation in English. The whole thing was published, uh, in its entirety, by the Philological Society. J Jamaican Pronunciation in London. I do beg your pardon. Yes. Isn't it strange? We're standing in front of an audience and do one. Jamaican Pronunciation in uh, the, the remarkable thing about this book is, is what you see when you hold it edgeways on and look at the side. Because from the front, yes, there's the title. Look it on, look, look at the side, and it's one centimeter thick from cover to cover. It's a model for what a dissertation should be like uh, in terms of brevity. It has one clear object. It goes about illuminating that object in the most direct way. When it's done that, it stops. It doesn't have a list of references rivaling the Library of Congress. <laughs> It doesn't have a survey of anything that's ever been written on any remotely related subject. Uh, it is a model of its kind. But I happen to know that it very nearly wasn't finished. Uh, not only do I remember Olive asking over and over again, how are you getting on, how are you getting on? <laughs> and John running away, he always used to run, he'd run up and down the stairs, uh, probably to avoid Olive's questions, I think. But, uh, <laughs> He, he ran, usually with a book in one hand, and I reckon like to borrow chocolate in the other <laughs> hand, uh, presumably to fuel the end of your stack. <laughs> uh, because, uh, I say, it, it didn't, almost didn't get finished. John came up with the favorite gambit of research students for avoiding doing any work, that is, change the topic. <laughs> and he went to see Doc and explained what he wanted to do. And Doc, to his great credit, wouldn't have anything of it. Doc knew the difference between a dissertation and a life's work. And John wanted to replace Jamaican pronunciation in London with what was to become accents of English. If Doc hadn't insisted, I don't know what would have happened. Maybe, maybe neither of the things would have got done. During the 70s, 60s, late 60s and 70s, linguistics was changing. Structuralists had talked mainly to other linguists, I think. And what they had to say was virtually impenetrable to anybody outside the field. But they started talking to sociologists and psychologists, people interested in language and society. And the new field of sociolinguistics came into being. People stopped writing sociolinguistics with a hyphen in it and produced this new compound, social linguistics. Uh, John had quite a hand in the development of social linguistics in Britain, I think. Uh, Accents of English is a tremendous cornerstone of what we know about accents. And uh, I think uh, Peter Trudgill was probably one of the people who suggested that book might be written or encouraged John to do it. Peter Trodgill at the time was inventing sociolinguistics, at least in its British variety. And you know, in the story, he actually invented it on a train on his way to a job interview <laughs> uh, in order to impress the panel. Uh, it was a pretty good idea. Uh, uh, Jerry Knowles was another person at the time who was making important contributions. And I think Jerry Knowles's work has featured in John's lectures every year since then uh, on Scouse. I can't say much about accents of English. It's, it's more than most people could possibly accomplish on their own, even in their entire life. And uh, among the many messages we've received, here's one from Inga Mace saying, uh, first of all, how much you have inspired her and so on. 
I'm totally devoted to your accents of English. It's absolutely fantastic. I don't know how you ever managed to write the three volumes. It seems to me that one would need several lives to complete a task of this type. I think John has done several lifetimes work in the various projects that he's undertaken at intervals. How people managed to discuss accents of English before John's book, I don't know. How did we manage before we had the standard lexical sets? I can remember sitting through Doc's lectures, my brain reeling as I tried to remember what was what in these systems that were being compared on the board. Once we got fleece, once we got kit and dress, we know what we're talking about. There's no word fart. There's no word wart. So thought but is perfectly OK. Mind you, there are still people around who will say, oh, yeah, I don't have the cut, cut merger. Producing two identical words uh, when they could have been using John's wonderful way of clarifying this. It's a detail, perhaps, I mean, but it appears in the opening pages of the first volume, but it's an extremely important contribution. As I started a little late, I'm going to take the liberty of going on a few more minutes, if that's OK. I know you're eager to go to your celebrations. We've heard how, in the early 80s, John got interested in computers. I can remember an occasion in the common room when I first saw a little shiny piece of paper about the size of a bus ticket. And on it, when you held it to the light in the right way, you could just make out an N and an ash. And this had come out of a Sinclair printer. Uh, of course, it wasn't long before we had dot matrix printers, all nine pins of them, producing primitive approximations to arithmetic symbols. And John started using this technology on a vast scale. A few years after that, it seems like only a couple of years after that had happened, he brought a little document to me and said, have a look at this. It was a few pages of dot matrix material. And I opened it. And what was it? Well, it was a trial for a new kind of pronunciation diction. It was the first trial for the what was to become the Longman Pronunciation Diction. And it was something I'd never seen before. Here were entries that looked like algebraic formulae. Here was information about the variants. Here was information about the languages from which the language, from which the words had been borrowed. So John really reinvented the whole concept of a pronouncing dictionary. And I must say, uh, bearing in mind who's chairing this session, the only other good one, <laughs> the, the, the only other good one is, is the sincerest form of flattery <laughs> to LPD. Uh, of course, LPD uh, appeared in 1990. There's a second edition which appeared in two, 2000, and uh, people tend to think of second edition as that's just an update. My own view is the second edition is even more important than the first. It's, it's, uh, a reworking full of new ideas, a different uh, decision about stress marking and so on. And if I had to choose one thing out of John's, uh, John's production that I want to keep, it is my copy of LPD, the second edition, 2000. And that brings me to another message. I've had a nice message from Jenny Ladifer uh, We saw pictures of Peter earlier, but here's a nice message from John, uh, from Jenny. I want to congratulate John on his retirement and wish him and Gabriel well. Peter kept copies of John's dictionary both at work and at home. He gave copies of it to his students when they graduated. Uh, so uh, there is Peter Ladifogid rewarding his students with copies of John's dictionary. And I can remember Peter looking at the dictionary and saying to me, well, I'd explained to Peter that John had not only written this dictionary, he also keyboarded it. Not many people know this. John actually keyboarded the whole thing. He, he didn't produce it with a team. He didn't hand anything over to anybody else. He handed over discs, and that's what became the dictionary. Peter was looking through it and said, it's hard to believe that anyone knows all this, let alone keyboarded it. And um, 
Obviously, he was very impressed with the dictionary, kept many copies. Jenny goes on with another compliment. Well, first she says, I remember John Peter in London, Germany, and San Francisco. What fun they had. The IPA was Peter's passion, and without John, it would not have survived. Yeah, there was a time when the IPA hung by a slender thread, and the one person keeping it going, mainly, was John. You will have noticed that there's a kind of cycle in John's productions. There's a kind of cycle of years. He's active all of the time. He's doing things all of the time. But the major works I'm referring to are spaced out. Accents of English in 1982, the Pronouncing Dictionary in 1990, the second edition of the Pronouncing Dictionary in 2000. So it's as if every so often, along with all the other many things John is doing, he produces something of major importance. Well, we now know you must brace yourself for another event of major importance, because John's new book on intonation is shortly to appear. We've had a number of references to it this afternoon, and John showed us a copy of the front cover, that picture of the front cover. But I have friends in high places. <laughs> in fact, Andrew's sitting up there. <laughs> and here is a copy. <laughs> no. The idea that occurs to me is, uh, usually authors autograph their books for their readers, but wouldn't it be nice if we pass this around and you, the readers, autograph the book for the author. So I'm going to pass it around the room, starting with Jay, the chairman, chairperson, and we can all leave the record in that. It's the only existing copy, and I'm told it's sort of pasted together from incomplete parts. <laughs> <laughs> and in various places it has printer's thumb marks on it and so on, but nevertheless it is a copy. Thank you very much to Andrew for bringing me to Long. Um, I, I want to round off. Uh, I can't do justice to John's academic achievements. I've mentioned a few landmarks, and that's about the best I can do. I wanted to round off by giving you a few personal observations of the secrets of John's success. How is it that John has managed to do so much, as Ingham is, says, several lifetimes work? Well, I've been observing John for a long time, and I can let you into a few secrets. I think I begin to understand how some of it is done. The first crucial thing, and this is absolutely important, and in a moment you're going to have to reach into your pocket and prove something to me, John is the only person of my close acquaintance who has never said to me, can you lend me a pen? <laughs> John always has a pen. <laughs> there you are, you see what you're saying. <laughs> he always has a pen. It's never the same one. He must own thousands of them in different colours. He's always got a pen. And the other thing is, the pen's no good without something to write on. He must always have something to write <laughs> on. Now, if you're thinking, oh, a trip to the stationers, fancy notebooks, filing systems, forget it. What you use is envelopes, the backs of old envelopes. And that is why I paid John the tribute of writing the notes of my speech on an envelope. It took me a long time to write this, not because I've written a lot, but I kept losing the envelope. <laughs> And no doubt, as the various clothes go to the cleaners over the summer, all the incomplete versions will turn up. I'll be able to piece them together and remember the speech I should have given if I'd put, held on to all the envelopes. Pen and paper. And the other thing, the other thing that uh, I must draw your attention to is John is wonderful proof of the fact that in order to succeed, you do not need to have a tidy office. <laughs> Indeed, 
there may just be evidence there <laughs> for the reverse. <laughs> John's office is famously, well, disorderly, untidy, <laughs> uh, compared with others, let's say, on a comparative scale. As you know, he's retiring shortly. He has to yield the office to a new occupant in September, so for months he's been throwing away rubbish, he's been generously giving away hundreds of books, going through many things. I was in John's office yesterday, and I can tell you that so far, all of this has had no effect whatsoever. <laughs> and if anything, it's rather worse. <laughs> there was an occasion when a, a, a reporter from a national newspaper came to interview John in the connection with the publication of one of his books, I expect. The reporter came to visit John in his room, and they sat there and talked, and the reporter took notes. He also had a camera. They came to the end of the interview, the reporter said, no, I must take a photograph, but it's a bit untidy in here. I can't really take a picture of you with all this stuff piled up. Don't any of your colleagues have tidier offices? <laughs> And John said, well, I think Michael Ashby's office is a bit tidier than mine. Maybe we can use that. So it was the end of a long day. John rang me up. I happened to be just leaving. He said, can I use your office? I said, of course, help yourself. So John and the reporter came down to my office. He sat at my desk. And then he started to look a bit wooden in front of the camera, a bit stiff. Couldn't get the right angle. Just at that moment, the telephone, my telephone on my desk rang. So John reached out to pick up my telephone, picked it up, started. And the reporter seized the moment and took a wonderfully natural picture of John. The academic surrounded by books and blackboards on the phone. This is how John came to be immortalized. In my office, sitting at my desk, <laughs> my blackboard <laughs> covered in my writing, <laughs> answering my phone. <laughs> and the ultimate irony is, who was ringing up? It was my wife. <laughs> and the look on John's face, this was not a look of intense concentration. It was the look anyone would have on their face if they were to pick up a phone and heard a voice say, what time of night do you call Mr. Dominic? <laughs> Well, it's appropriate that we're talking about time and eating because I think shortly we have to think about winding up these proceedings and moving on to the reception where we'll be eating and drinking and celebrating. We will be drinking a toast down there in the cloisters, but it seemed to Valerie and me that the cloisters is a totally unsuitable place to try and make any further speeches. And so, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything, or if there are still things that we must say. This is really the final opportunity where everyone can hear and see, I think, for the day. I don't know if John would like to have a last word. If not, Valerie, yeah, we, we, we know that... Um, I will not give a speech, don't worry. Um, we uh, wanted to, of course, make a presentation, a gift to John, to on one of his retirement. And he very, very generally said, very good, I can't Generously. Generously said. Um, <laughs> I'll donate it to charity. <laughs> or I'll donate it to charity, or whatever intonation you use. So um, the collection will go towards his two chosen charities, uh, Diabetes UK and the Terence Higgins Trust. But we have here a book of a number of comments and, and memories from friends who are here today and those who are not. So I'll make this presentation. And those of you who have not had a chance to write in this book and would like to add during the reception. And I'd like to invite you all to a reception which will be in the cloisters downstairs and also in the garden at the back of the cloisters. So without further ado, again, congratulations. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. in the
closest to the 